Ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha. I apologize for adding in a last minute addendum at the beginning of the video like this, but I wanted to let you know that there is no reason to stay sitting watching the screen. Feel free to get up, move around, maybe grab a bite to eat. There will be gameplay footage on the screen, but it will only be there for those that wish to see something while I'm talking. There will be no visual cues shown in this particular video as its intent is merely to discuss and offer up some advice on topics that I have seen as a fairly common pitfall when it comes to newer independent developers. Also, you might hear my daughter laughing in the background once or twice. While I realize it is slightly unprofessional of me to not re-record this video, it's getting rather late, so on that note, you have my apologies. That said, let's get on with it, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha. Every once in a while, I'm approached by startup independent developers asking for advice when it comes to their games and their gaming community. Usually, I try not to respond to those directly because honestly, it would just take up too much time to write, and unfortunately, there just aren't enough hours in the day to begin with. And while it's not a daily occurrence by any stretch of the imagination, it's happened enough in the past that I decided to finally mull it over, and I've put together a bit of a list of talking points in this regard. And while I know this is probably won't be of a large amount of value to most people, I do hope that there's at least some developers out there that will be helped by this, and even if there's just a single person, that's good enough for me. So here it is, a critic's perspective on games development. This is, of course, entirely my opinion on this, so take it for what you will. There's a lot of pitfalls to being an independent developer that I've seen, and I've criticized other developers for nearly every item on this list. And while this is by no means everything I could think of, I think this list will cover most of the basics fairly effectively. Now, first on our list today is know your limitations. A game design is creative to be sure, but there's also as much talent and skill as anything else. It's easy to go crazy and start including wild ideas about what you do or don't want in your game. This would fall along with similar lines as within the IT world, and that is the acronym KISS, or Keep It Simple Stupid. It's all well and good to have a grand plan for your game, but make sure it's something you're capable of doing first. One of the worst things I've seen that can happen to a game developer is trying to learn how to do something along the way, and that is not limited to indie game development either. Now take a look at Mass Effect Andromeda. They spent years trying to get procedural generation to work, eating up the vast majority of the time that should have been spent on actual development. Their steadfast attempt with procedural generation, which ultimately failed, was one of, if not the, main reason why the game ended up with only 18 months in actual development. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, then don't plan on figuring it out later. To do so would be disastrous for your game. Along that line, also make sure you have all of the tools you need before you begin. This falls in line with project management, which is something that developers working on more complex games will know very well. If you have no experience with project management, I would strongly suggest taking a course. Even an online course system like lynda.com has some extremely well done project management courses and trust me, there is a definite benefit to be had there. Next, we have early access. Now, while I know that early access sounds like a fantastic idea for many developers, bear in mind that it comes with its own set of caveats and project management skills will be even more crucial if you think about going that route. With early access, updates are beyond critical to your success. They will become the lifeblood of your game and you will find yourself sinking a titanic amount of time into simply releasing news updates and answering questions within your game forums as well as discussing and troubleshooting bugs within that particular game build on top of it. It's a tremendous time sink to do it right, and if you are flying solo on your game, then I would most definitely not recommend going the early access route because the time invested in managing your early access backers is time taken away from your game. Of course, there are other options if you're looking into supplemental funding, and one of the more popular options is Kickstarter. Now, your success on Kickstarter is more often than not dependent on a certain amount of luck, as is everything else when you're first starting out. However, there are some things that I think you can do to help ensure a little bit more success. Now first, of course, as is with everything, do your research. Look at what other successful Kickstarter campaigns for games of your style and genre were doing with their pages. Form an outline of how you want to design your Kickstarter and pay attention to the particulars. Remember, this is your first introduction of not only your game, 
but of you as well. Now, this method will take a good amount more planning than others. You'll need to figure out everything surrounding your game, which is also where that project management class will come in handy yet again. Timelines, scope of work, amount of funds needed, basically every bit of information you need for your Kickstarter campaign will need to be figured out in the planning stages of your game. And in reference to specifics, I would say don't ask for more than what you need. Factoring in, of course, a reasonable allowance for delays, as delays can and will happen. And if you don't plan for a certain amount of them, then you will most likely fail to meet your goal. Next is, of course, written and visual presentation. A full trailer showcasing gameplay will help make your game more attractive. Also, if you have a working demo for people to get their hands on, then you're way ahead of the game. Most Kickstarters don't include that, and it's an excellent way to showcase what you've accomplished so far, and it can and will entice backers much more than just a video and some text. Also, one of the biggest dangers of Kickstarter are the stretch goals and the potential of scope creep. Uh, make sure you give careful consideration on whether to include stretch goals at all and how far to go with them if you do. Many a game has suffered scope creep, and that is one of the larger problems with failed Kickstarter games. People attempting more and more ridiculous stretch goals that end up burying the game in an unrealistic cycle of development. Next up, we have the ever-present worry in regards to pre-made assets. Now, I know that a lot of games have been rightfully labeled asset flips in the past, putting in absolutely no effort whatsoever into their games. However, pre-made assets can be an extremely useful tool when used correctly. Even AAA games make use of pre-made assets in certain scenarios. You see, what people want is something creative, something that you created, not what something someone else created. That doesn't mean that you can't make use of some tools to help make your life easier, but make sure that everything you implement has something of you in it. There is a world of difference between purchasing Unit Z and selling it unchanged on the Steam storefront and purchasing a pack of paintings to adorn the walls of the level you created or a wall of texture for a certain area within the game. Now, a good example of what I'm talking about would be the game Stardrop. Now, this developer actually reached out to me via email with this very concern. He didn't want to be labeled an asset flipper, and he actually seemed to be extremely worried about that. This prompted me to play what he had created so far as the game was coming out into early access, and I was quite impressed. The voice actors were doing a great job, and while he did make use of a lot of pre-made assets, he did so creatively and made sure to make them his own. I was so impressed that I added Stardrop and its developers into the still small but growing list of diamond devs on my channel. Now, next on my list involves the actual development of the game itself. So many aspects are overlooked within so many indie games that will actually put some people off, and it's that attention to detail that will bring subtle but noticeable value to your game. Simple improvements that can be made that, if overlooked, can and will make your game feel less complete than it should be. First and foremost is stock menus and settings. And before your game is released, make sure you give those areas some thought and effort. A full and robust options menu and title screen will show a level and dedication to the quality of your game much more than the stock Unity menu ever will. Also, within every aspect of your game, don't half-ass it. You've got to go either full-ass or no-ass. If you want to include something in your game, then include it and make sure it's incorporated well and feels natural like it belongs there and the game would be empty without it. If an aspect or feature of the game is poorly implemented or integrated, the entire game will suffer as a result. Now next up, of course, is the dangers of promotion. Now, you can make the best game in the world, but without promotion, it's hard to get your game out there and get noticed. Two of the more common sites to help with this is Keymailer and Terminals by Evolve. These are perhaps the most common sites for distributing review code and should always be one of your first go-tos in that aspect. However, bear in mind that Terminals does have a barrier to entry that I believe starts at around $1,000. It's a hefty price to pay and as such will most likely not be for first-time developers, but once you get more established, it's well worth checking out. Now, in addition to that, if you want to be thought of as a legitimate games developer, steer well clear of the myriad groups and individuals promising positive reviews in trade for game keys or any other form of revenue. Invariably, these are people running bot farms that will post a large number of fake reviews for your game and will turn around and either sell those game keys through the gray market or they will use those keys to feed their Steam trading card bot farms in order to generate a profit at your expense in one way or another. 
This will also have the added detriment of making your game actually appear far less attractive in the eyes of prospective buyers and of critics like myself. However, some Steam groups can be of value, but I would recommend that you again do your research. Find groups that are fans of your particular genre that don't actively engage in key giveaways or what would be considered shady behavior. You can approach legitimate fan groups and perhaps request some QA testing. This can be valuable to gather information and fix bugs if you aren't going the early access route. Just be careful in who you ask, because if you ask the wrong group, you could end up giving away a lot of keys for nothing more than help fill someone else's pocket. Now, I'd also like to take a moment to also talk about disclosure for a moment. Now, I've discovered this a couple of times now, and it's always regretful to see. Disclosure is important, and transparency is key in so many areas, so whether it be from you, the developer, forum moderators, your friends, or your family, don't review your own game or ask any of them to do it for you. Even if you ask them to review honestly, that relationship to either you or that professional tie to the game creates a clear and defined bias that will color the perception of the person reviewing the product. While that will ultimately lead to an inaccurate review, it's also extremely dishonest and misrepresents your game to the consumer. I know it might sound like a good idea, but trust me, it's really not. And continuing on down our list here, we have the topic surrounding working with your customers and community. Now, I'm sure you've heard the old adage, no news is good news. Well, when you're developing a game, the exact opposite is actually true. Always, always, always release regular updates on the progress of your game if you're in a Kickstarter or early access. Even if you have nothing more to say than, sorry guys, no new patch this week or this month, we're still working on these parts of the game. That is still far more preferable than hiding in silence. I know that it can be disheartening simply stating that there's nothing more to report, but when you're dealing with the evolution of development with backers of any type, silence is deafening and will cause you far more problems than it will ever solve. Now, carrying along with that is responding to and accepting criticism. You will catch a lot of flack from some avenues regardless, but try to remember that there will also be a ton of criticism of your game, and most of it is legitimate. Listen to not only what your customers are telling you, but more what they're not. You can pick up on trends within the critique, and that could potentially steer you towards a change in your game that could make it a great deal better. This can be valuable information, assuming you don't allow yourself to get overwhelmed, which I know can happen. Always remember that when you're responding to criticism or anything else, that you're never doing it from a place of anger or emotion. Lose your cool, and you lose respect. So do whatever you can to keep your cool and always try to remember that these people are paying money to play the game that you are creating. Treat them with respect and most of them will reciprocate. Not only that, but maintaining a professional demeanor will earn you even more respect and will begin to earn you some positive brand recognition, which is worth its weight in gold. Now, the last thing I have to talk about is, of course, pricing. Know your value. Remember that it's not about what you think you're worth. It's far more about what the customer is willing to pay. For the most part, your customers won't care whether you spent 400 hours making a game or 10,000 hours. It's all about the quality and quantity of the gameplay. Now take a look at what other similar games are charging and also think about factoring in level of graphics and length of time. Fancier graphics don't a good game make, but cheaper games also aren't expected to have the greatest graphics in the world. However, better graphics can sometimes help, and as such, I would typically expect a $30 game to have far better graphics than a simple 8-bit retro platformer for $5. Also, remember that if you have a 2-4 to four hour experience, people will definitely feel shortchanged if you're charging higher prices. Many people rate good value for gameplay at minimum of $1 per one hour of gameplay. However, if you have a game that has a diverse enough feature set that will allow multiple playthroughs, you can have an 8 hour experience 4 or 5 times, making it potentially good value for a $15 or $20 game. Now make sure you do your research, because if you are posting your game on Steam, changing your price later is extremely difficult. It's not a simple value change and then it hits save. You actually have to go through an approval process with Valve. Now lastly, I'd have to say that most of this can be summed up in just a few simple words. Be creative, be careful, and take your time. And for God's sake, make sure you're having fun with it. If your game becomes tedious or a chore to create, it might begin to feel that way for the gamer playing it. Now that said, I could have gone on for a lot longer on this list, but I hope that it at least 
is of some use to a few developers out there and will hopefully help someone avoid some of the traps and pitfalls that I've seen befall other games in the past. If anyone watching would like to offer up their own advice for any prospective indie developers, I'm sure they would be more than grateful to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha, and I'll see you next time.